Welcome to Troweling Down, Biblical Archaeology for the 21st Century. Hi, I'm Gary Byers. I'm the host, and I want to introduce to you our guest, our special guest, our own personal rock star, Dr. Stephen Collins, director of the excavation of Tal Al Hammam, Jordan. And it's a special site, and we're on location here at a very important part of the site. So, Dr. Steve Collins, Tal Al Hammam, a massive city in the southern Jordan Valley. You got permission to dig here. Been doing it for 15 years. How in the world did you ever find this site? What brought you to this site? Pure and simple, short story, Gary. Um, it was the biblical text because I had been studying, in fact, I was in a documentary in the early 90s talking about Baba Dra and Amir, the southern sites, southern Dead Sea sites, uh, traditional sites for Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, I was in a documentary touting those sites <laughs> as Sodom and Gomorrah. And, um, but eventually I began to really study into it, and the more I studied the biblical text, the more I recognized that the, the, the text, particularly Genesis chapter 13, uh, locates it north of the Dead Sea. I couldn't find anything in there that would locate it south, but everything in there locates it north, right across the valley, right over here from Bethel and I. Lot, remember, Lot lifted up his eyes, looked over and saw that the plain of the Jordan, the Kikar, the circle of the Jordan Valley was well watered, and he came eastward and pitched his tent as far as Sodom. Now that's in Genesis chapter 13, 13. in the Bible. So you read the Bible, and Everything else you'd read said it's down there, but you read the Bible and you go, wow, it looks like it should be up north. The Bible was very clear and is very clear that Sodom was the largest Bronze Age city on the east side of the Jordan River, northeast of the Dead Sea. And with that, with that biblical information, we came looking for the largest Bronze Age city on the east side of the Jordan River, northeast of the Dead Sea. And lo and behold, uh, we came across many sites there, there are dozens of sites all around us, some fairly large tells. Within a, within a five kilometer radius, we have 14 major archeological sites. But the Bible says Sodom was the largest one. Remember, it's always mentioned first. Yes. It's the only one whose king has a voice. And it's the only one ever mentioned by itself. Yeah. It's the biggest city on the Eastern Jordan disc. So we looked for that site. Well, Tal al Hammam is the largest Bronze Age city on the Eastern Jordan disc. And that by several orders of magnitude. Now, talk about this Eastern Jordan disc a little bit. What, what does that mean? Is that actually in the Bible? Well, when you see that word cities of the plain in Genesis chapter 13, the word plain is the Hebrew word kikar. And the Hebrew word kikar simply means a flat circular disc of metal, like a talent in the Bible, a flat ingot of metal, or a flat circular loaf of bread, like a pita bread, <laughs> or a tortilla from where I come from. And so a flat circle. Now. When you look at the Jordan Valley from the Southern Jordan Valley from any angle, from the other side, from this side, it's a large widening of the alluvial plain of the Jordan Valley north of the Dead Sea. It's green. Uh, it has the best, it's the best watered agriscape in the region. It has lots of springs. It has the Jordan River. You really don't even need rain, which is why the Genesis 13 says it's watered like Egypt because Egypt didn't need rain. They had the Nile River. They had the overflowing of the Nile. And the Jordan River in antiquity would overflow its banks to several kilometers wide, north of the Dead Sea. And they would plant behind the receding waters in the newly deposited silt. silt. This is exactly like Egypt in miniature. Like the Nile. And of course, this water is coming from the mountains, the Jordanian yes. plateau up here. And there's actually two springs right here on both sides, two, uh, two uh, yes. wadis coming down from the mountain right here. And there are springs, thus the name of the site? Is Tal al Hammam, or the site of, uh, the word Hammam is sort of the modern room uh, word for restroom. In Arabic. In Arabic. Uh, so, you know, facetiously sometimes we call it Tel Toilet. But I mean, that's, that's, that's the whole idea. But it's because of the Roman bath. There's a Roman bathhouse taking advantage of the springs gushing up right on the site. Here. And, and Turkish baths have always been called hammams. Yes, hammams. So this was a hot springs right yes. here. And we got the Roman bath to prove it. And actually, we've been in the hot springs. Yes. We, we've put our hands down and they're warm in the middle of the winter. That's right. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yes. So, so you identified this site uh, from research uh, uh, surveys. You came and found the site yourself. How in the world did you get permission 
to actually dig this site? Well, we found the site uh, in our, in our uh, after I had done the research on where Sodom really should be, northeast of the Dead Sea, and you know, working with the, with the Hebrew text, um, we had to get on the ground. So the first time we actually saw all the sites here, including Talamam, was in 2001. So we came in 2001, and I was not planning, because remember, we were excavating together up in the West Bank, but, the, but it had just shut down. I wasn't really thinking early on when I started the research about doing another dig because we were already involved in that. We were digging where Abraham and Lot were when Lot looked, looked east. east. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, um, but in the process of all that, you know, things got a little dicey in the West Bank. We had to shut the, uh, the dig down, you remember. And of course, then as an archeologist, you think, uh-oh, what am I gonna do now? I got, he started getting antsy for another project. And so we, um, I thought, ah, the Sodom issue, because I've been studying that for years, and, and uh, we, we wanted to do something definitive on the subject. And so we uh, came to Jordan, and we followed the biblical text and came to the sites, and this was the largest one, and we walked up on top of it, and I thought, somebody needs to excavate this. If this site is really Sodom, which even at that early time, I thought it, it fits all the geography. In fact, back in the 1880s, William Thompson, the and the explorer Condor yeah. uh, stood on top of this site. Those two famous explorers stood on top of this site, camped right here, and they said, which one of these sites around us or the one we're standing on is Sodom? We don't know, but it has to be one of these because it's exactly where the Bible says it should be. They did exactly the same analysis of the biblical text that we did, and they came to the same location. And just for the record, we are we are at, down in a in a excavation area that's already 15 feet below, but we're up on that top level where Condor and Thompson came and looked and saw things. They even talked about the little green frogs chirping at night. Right down there. That's right. So uh, so you uh, you you found the same place that they found. You said it really does fit. Now that was geography. We knew geography. What about the archaeology of it? Well, when we began to excavate, you know, it, people knew about the site from the surveys. We found that out early on. People had been here. They had surveyed it. They had done uh, surface surveys looking at the pottery. Everybody just assumed it was all Iron Age. But we thought, no, this fits the biblical geography. These cities should be in the Middle Bronze Age, the time of Abraham. So we started to excavate. Of course, we immediately encountered the Iron Age because it's right on the surface. <laughs> up there. See some walls here? These are, some of these higher walls are, are belong to the Iron Age. But as we began to excavate down on both, the, uh, on both the upper city and multiple locations on the lower city, when we got underneath the Iron Age, immediately we jumped back 700 years mm -hmm. to the Bronze Age. It, the Iron Age material was sitting right on top of the Middle Bronze Age. Now what does that mean? It means that the Middle Bronze Age city was completely and utterly destroyed and nobody built or lived on the site for the next 700 years. Now, when, um, when, you, when you came here and saw the site and said somebody ought to excavate it, this is such a big site, it, it, it's amazing. Here you are leading a, a, a small Christian university in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Didn't really know anybody, have any contacts here in Jordan. And you said somebody ought to dig this well, why not us? How in the world were you able to get permission to dig this site now for 15 years? Well, you know, my, my, uh, my philosophy has always been start from the top. Now, I don't, I don't mean the king, <laughs> okay. But uh, I immediately uh, got, got an appointment with the, with the Director General of the Department of Antiquities here in Jordan. And I sat down with him eyeball to eyeball for five years. Every year I would come, at least once a year, sometimes twice, because I'd bring tours here as well. And so I'd come and we'd sit down, I'd talk about, I'm, you know, let's talk about excavating Tal Hammam. And he would always put me off. He would always say, no, 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 um, Dr. Collins, you could have any other site in Jordan you want. You just name the site in Jordan, but not that one. And I would say, why? Why not that one? And that went on for four years. In the Did he have a good reason why? Well, he would never tell me. In the fifth year, I took a friend of mine who used to work for the Department of Antiquities, who speaks Arabic, you know, very well. And Dr. Fawaz didn't really speak English all that well. And so I wanted to make sure we were hearing each other clearly. So I brought him and he did finally tell me why uh, it had something to do with 
certain kind of, you know, Israelite house and, and that sort of thing being published from Jordan. And, and the politicians got all upset about it and, and those kinds of things. Now, the archaeologists couldn't have cared less. But, you know, how that plays in the, you know, whenever you try to bring the Bible into modern politics, it's never good. <laughs> never a good idea. So um, that sort of quashed the idea of a, of a, of a Bible-believing evangelical coming in and excavating in Jordan. And, and I told him, I said, Dr. Fawaz, I'm not going to do that to you. You know, I'm not going to do that. And so he, he sort of raised up, he was kind of a short guy, kind of raised up on his, on his desk. And he said, all right, get me a proposal. So after, after having conversations with him for five years, and he's offered me any, any place I want to dig in Jordan but that, now he says, okay, get me a proposal. And eight months later, we wound up back in Jordan uh, in September of 2005 with a proposal in hand. They accepted it. He said, when do you want to start? And like an idiot, I said, December. I mean, it's September <laughs> already. I said, December. I mean, you know, strike while the iron's hot, I'm thinking. So we did. And you remember, we put a team of about, what, 20, 20, 25 people together, and we had people standing by. We said, if you want to go with us and start this excavation, you have to be willing to get your airfare and get here at the drop of a hat. Because when we announce when we're going, you, you got to jump. And they did. And we put a team in. Uh, in, in December 2005, we were here. Okay, now there's one other part of the story that I remember. Uh, the site had never been given to anyone else prior to this time. And you would have thought such a big, important site would have been given to someone else. It wouldn't have been available to you. But the reason it was still available in, in early 2000 was because of what? Well, um, up to that time, it had been in the military area. I mean, the, the top of the site is rather damaged by military a lot, activity. A lot of evidence of military yes. tank emplacements yeah. up here on the upper tall. They, they did a lot of And work. there had been mines laid <laughs> across the western slopes and down, um, which was a problem. You know, you know when you're digging, it's, it's not a, a good to run into that sort of thing. And so, uh, but it had been in 1996, starting in around 1996, they swept the area of mines. They cleaned it up, and I suppose what the... You know what the mine sweepers didn't find the sheep and the goats over the, you know over the decades since then yes. had found and um, so it was it was clean and so they opened the area up again and the farmers moved in and the people began to move into the area and then here we come and uh, nobody has ever excavated the site now nobody was nobody was vying for it didn't know about it, really. And so many people still today, especially in other places like uh, on the other side of the river, they have very little information about Tal Hammam. They got Jericho on the other side, one, one town on the western Kikar. We got 14 major ones over here on the eastern Kikar, but they know nothing about it, very little about it. And so um, we have literally put Tal Hammam on the map. Oh, but by the way, we have a new road sign. We saw it, we took a picture. With a little archaeological site signature on it, you know, a little uh, sign on it. Tall Hamam. So that's nice. We have finally are on the map. And a fellow that visited this season with us uh, from Singapore said, came up the road by himself, and he said, uh, I said, how did you get here? He said, Google said this is Sodom. So we're now on Google, too. Yes. We really arrived. Yep. Well, this is a wonderful place to dig. We've done it for 15 seasons. There is so much more to find. Come back with us again. We want to tell you more about biblical archaeology in the 21st century, and we'll focus on Tal al Hamam, the site that we think is, in fact, biblical Sodom of Sodom and Gomorrah. Thanks for joining us.